perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And really, that's, that's the reason we're here this morning, isn't it? To focus our attention on him. Uh, we're not here. We, we enjoy the fellowship. We enjoy all the social aspect of church. But our purpose is to focus our mind on the Lord. So let's do that today. So good to see all of you in service this morning. Good to have, I hope I get it correct. Is it Tim and Elena? Alana? Jim. Jim. I, I have Jim written down here. How about that? I can't read my own writing. Jim. Jim and his family. Sadarna. So glad to have you. Well, three beautiful girls. I think they were here last Sunday, but my first time to meet them. So, so glad to have you in service today. So good to see Phil and his boys with us this morning. Welcome. So glad to see you. And uh, Christy, so glad to see you. Welcome. And uh, we've got about, how many was it? 40. 40. 40 of our congregation in Pennsylvania this week. Can you believe that? And they are fixing to get 12 to 14 inches of snow. <laughs> Started a little while ago. So, so, but they're all up at the youth convention uh, today, and uh, so we want to remember them. And we'll miss them, but glad they're there. Why don't we stand together? Let's welcome the presence of the Lord. Randy's coming to lead us here in just a moment in singing, but we want to focus our attention. God could help us this morning to lay aside all of those things that plague us and uh, grab for our attention. And there's a lot. There's a lot in my life right now to grab my attention. But I want to pull away from all of that and focus on Him today. That's where I find comfort and peace. That's where I find solace. So let's look to Him. Father, what a joy it is to be in Your house on the Lord's day. Amen. We truly are glad to come into Your house. We're, we're grateful today that your people are gathered. Many of our people are not here, but we're trusting you to be with them in Pennsylvania and give protection to them. And us who are here, oh God, we, we pray you would help us to be able to push aside those things that would divert our attention from you and to focus our mind and hearts on worship. We commit this service to you and we'll give you praise for all that you do and accomplish in us today. In Jesus' name. Remain standing if you will. Get your songbook and let's join together in singing. Isn't it a privilege to sing together? Let's Amen. do it this morning as Randy leads us. Amen. Amen. Now you've already heard that several are gone, so that means that you have to make up the difference. And uh, we're to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Doesn't have to be on tune, just has to be joyful. Amen. Amen. Let's start with that little course, our course book, and I've lost my page. But uh, for God so loved this world. That he gave. Aren't you glad that he gave? Amen. Amen. It's in the key of F, but I don't know what page it's in.
name. Praise his precious name. Turn to page 450, if you would, in your hymn books. This song come to mind early this morning. Be not dismayed, whatever be time. For God will take care of you. Yes, sir. I don't know why he brought this to mind, but somebody needs it this morning. We all need it. We need to have the comfort of knowing that God is standing right there beside us. Amen. Praise his name. somebody else and, right. and your experience to me. I'm glad we have our own Amen. relationship Amen. with the Heavenly Father. Praise, Praise His name. Turn on back to page 472. Standing on the promises. 
I had my wife Google on the way up here how many promises there was in the Bible. 8,810, I believe, promises in the Bible. And 7,487, if I got that number right, I just read it a couple times, is directed from God to you. Amen. You can stand on the promises of God. I'm 55 years old, and I will tell you today, God has never failed me one time. I failed God plenty of times, but he has never, ever failed Randy Staley one time. I'm so glad for the goodness of God. Let's sing it together. something strong and solid on which to stand and something that I can grasp and uh, know that God is there or as we sang, God will take care of you. Amen. We sang that and I looked out over the congregation, though I don't know much, as much about our congregation as our pastor, yet I know just enough to know that uh, sitting in this congregation, 
there are all kinds of things that need God's care. Yes. I looked at physical issues, people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. I looked at family issues, yes. families that are being impacted physically and emotionally. And, uh, and, and I looked at financial issues. You Just go ahead and name them out. They're right here. Rel relatively small group of people, and yet every single one of us stand in need yes, of having sir. that promise. My God name. will take care Amen. of you. Yeah. I need it. Yeah. Uh, Brother Randy said something about 30, no, 55 years. Like, well, let's just add, let me add my 30 on top of that and tell you it still is true. Yes. And we can stand on the yes, promises sir. of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it's so good to see all of you here. Most of you look like you're in a reasonably good humor. A smile doesn't hurt any of you. Uh, <laughs> evidently, that didn't take very well. <laughs> but most of you look good, and I'm so glad that you're here this morning. And uh, as has already been mentioned, I am thinking about those 40 people that could be here, uh, should be here, maybe. Uh, out in the wilds of Pennsylvania, enjoying how many inches? They said, someone said 12, somebody else said 14, so I don't know. <laughs> you know how much snow I like? Now remember, I'm a Pennsylvania boy, all right? <clears throat> I like one and a half inches one time a year, and that's enough. <laughs> so anyhow, they're talking about 12 inches, 14 inches, out in central Pennsylvania, and the pastor told me some of our people are thinking about starting back today because of the bad weather. Um, I don't know. But what I am really trying to get at, my focus is, we have a lot of people out there, they're in a youth convention, and from what we, little bit we saw online, evidently they have a full house in spite of, uh, in spite of the weather. And of course, Harry Plank would... Uh, draw many of us in. I would love to hear Harry Plank again. I love that guy. I love his preaching. Anyhow, let's remember our people out there, there are young people, children, older people. Let's remember that God will make this a great, great day. Amen. I think uh, last year, maybe, I had something like 1,500 or 1,800 people crowded into a 500 capacity church, uh, but they still had a great service. Not just numbers, it's a matter of opening our hearts and allowing Amen. God to come and minister. And so I want us to pray for the youth convention. And uh, as I said, I looked, uh, you know, I looked at our pastor and his wife and thinking about their son and thinking about it a lot. And uh, thinking it could be my son. And I think, I think the worst thing is I see it for... The worst thing right now is that we really don't know where we are, what's going to happen. We, we still need, as I recall, hearing maybe a pathologist to come and examine uh, the biopsies, the tests, and make a final determination. And I think that being hung there without really knowing what's going on uh, has to be a very stressful thing. And I want us to pray for our pastor and his wife and all of the family who are carrying that concern today that God will be with them, and especially God will reach out to Daryl Lee and touch him with his special presence today. Remember the Albertsons, uh, son and daughter-in-law. Uh, the baby isn't born yet. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday, all right, coming up on Tuesday. This is a very, a very serious thing, so we need to reach out to Randy and his wife and that baby to be born. The baby is not a number. The baby is a human and with significant physical effects. And so we need to remember that family in special prayer, that God will be with them in a special way. Remember, Mike, your, your requests are here. We've been over them dozens of times. I'm not trying to negate. I'm just simply telling that they have been here, and let's have God impress those upon our minds and our hearts as we pray here in just a few moments. Um, I underlined... Uh, the Winklers, they have a special request. And oh yes, and Regina, Sister Regina's brother Berlin in the hospital in Georgia. And uh, yesterday I noted that he was low 
uh, physically, and that's, that's, that's so sad. Nobody can see him. Nobody can get to him. And, uh, but God can be with you. Amen? God will take care of you. And so let's remember Verlin in prayer and all of that family that are involved. And we're going to pray together. I'm so glad that you're here, Dr. Phil, and I want you to lead us here in just a moment uh, in prayer. My own heart is yearning this morning. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for God. Hungry for his moving. Hungry for revival. There's a thirst in my soul. And the good thing about it is that God hears those kinds of prayers. The more anxious we are after him, the more devoted we are, we are to seek him, the more God is going to come. God comes where he is wanted. And I want him this morning. Amen? How many would nod your head and say amen, Brother Psyche? I want you to. Let's stand together, please. Dr. Phil, you lead us, but let's all of us join whatever's in your heart. This is the time to take it to God, and let's see what God will do for us. Even today, as Dr. Phil leads us. joining us in prayer. I like to believe for when God's people pray, God's here. God hears. Amen. And I believe that he is here this morning and I appreciate the sense of his presence. Let's do remember this. It doesn't get often mentioned, but let's do remember the beginning of Seabreeze Camp coming up on Thursday of this week. Uh, Thursday night through two Sundays. And I know that uh, uh, Mark and Melody are going to drive Janet and I down to uh, down to Florida, we were not going to go. <clears throat> I, did, I knew that I couldn't do it physically, but when Mark said, you know, Dad, I'll drive you down. I thought, well, maybe maybe we can make it. So let's remember Seabreeze Camp. Uh, actually, Brother Loper is one of the evangelists this year. So pray for the beginning of the camp meeting that God will make 
uh, the camp meeting in Florida, a great time of blessing. Also, <clears throat> may I say as a kind of a lay person in the, in the church, I'd like to express appreciation for our, our beautiful sanctuary. Um, I like how neat and clean the sanctuary is. One of the things that happens up front is if you have four microphones on a stand, and from where you are, you can probably see them in those four microphones, very neat, very clean, different colors, kind of, kind of sharp. Uh, but underneath are four coils of wire because microphones, except a newer one, microphones don't just stand out in the air. There are wires down there. <coughs> and I think we only have a solo coming up this morning. <clears throat> but if you bring four people up here to use those microphones, those wires go everywhere. And somebody has to come back and wind them up and put them in neat little circles there on the floor. I really appreciate a nice, clean sanctuary. One of the things that somewhere got stuck in my mind when I walk in at the back of a sanctuary, I look up through, and if the song books are all lined up, I know that somebody has been there. It looks neat. And that makes me feel good. Yeah. And our church is always nice. Outside, what can you, if you're going to say something detracting, no, I don't I'm not. I'm going to thank Dale and Betty Lawson for doing just oh, what you good did. Good deal. <laughs> All right, I didn't know who did it, but thank you very much. Outside, there's not too much you can do this morning, all right? It's just one of those, even though the pastor did come along and try to clear a path for, <laughs> for me to get through the waters of the Red Sea that were alongside of my car. But uh, we, I'm just thankful we have a beautiful church and a wonderful parsonage families, and we ought to be thankful for it, and I know and believe that you are. We're going to say what I hope will be a faith-increasing little course. I know it's something Sister Stetler likes, and I like it. It is no secret what God can do, and what he's done for others he'll do for you. So whatever you may be grappling with, all right, and I know what some people are grappling with, but whatever it is, just remember this, it's no secret what God can do. Amen. We'll just let him have his, let's sing it together, all right? It is no secret. It is no secret. God has done for us, you'd have to agree Amen. it's no secret Amen. what God can do. How I thank Him for it. How Amen. I bless Him. Even, not just in spiritual things, that, that's the most important, but even in physical things. I heard Mark last night give his story uh, again about how God preserved his life uh, when his car was attacked. And even though I've heard it a number of times, and Janet were, and I were there within what, about 48 hours of the incident happening, and uh, walked with Mark and Melody through a very difficult time, but as he spoke out of mind, word, look what God has done. Yes, yes. And it has to be the hand of God, yes. and I thank him yes, for it. God. So I want us to sing it one more time and praise him for it. It's no secret what God can do, and this morning, whatever you're wrestling with, just remember one thing, it's no secret Amen. what God can do. Let's sing it together. Is the secret what God can do? What is done for others?
was just texting with a layman friend of mine in North Carolina this morning, and uh, he said in January of 1969, a wayward, sinful, wicked young man, God rescued me, changed my life. Amen. And uh, I want to tell you, with arms wide open, he'll pardon me. Amen. <laughs> I'm glad he will. Praise the Lord. And uh, some of us are praying some big prayers right now about some big needs. But I'm glad God knows exactly it's not a big deal. You know, God's not sitting in the corner wringing his hands saying, what am I going to do now? He knows exactly how to handle every situation. And I'm glad he does. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Sam. Let me mention a couple of announcements. One, let me read this. Thank you for the many prayers and beautiful flowers and meals you've blessed me with during these rough times. God bless you all. And that's from Rachel Hill and the loss of her son. So continue to remember Sister Hill and her family and uh, ask the Lord to minister to them. Also several announcements. Of course the uh, youth convention ends tonight and the group is trying to decide how and when to come back. I think the Arkers are already on their way back. We're fearful about tomorrow. That storm was hitting starting this morning and probably going through the day and through the night. Tomorrow might not be a good day to travel. So get, uh, pray the Lord will, will give them wisdom. Andy said we've checked to see uh, if we can stay one more night where we're staying just to see. We're trying to figure it out. And I know Anna O'Donnell said I'm nervous. The smarter kids are up there, you know. And is your husband there too? No, okay. Okay. All right. But uh, so let's let's remember all of the group. And uh, tonight at five o'clock, I need to have a board meeting. If you men uh, can participate in that, the men on the board, please at five o'clock this evening before church. So keep that in mind. We're having a membership meeting on Wednesday night after the service. So uh, if you're a member, we invite you to stay. And uh, we may end up having to have two of these to keep them going too late. We've done that before where we have our reports and then we'll have elections as well. So, uh, But Wednesday night, membership meeting after prayer meeting, so keep that in mind. Uh, on the 6th, we're planning, that would be Saturday, we're planning a uh, men's breakfast, men's fellowship breakfast and prayer time together. That will be at the fellowship hall at 8.30 Saturday morning. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board. Uh, for food to bring, so keep that in mind. And uh, some of you men may be able to get your wife to cook a casserole or something, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to make the coffee, and uh, so <laughs> my wife's going to do whatever cooking for my house. So, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know. Randy might get people to do something. Randy's a pretty good cook himself, so I don't know. But uh, all right, so keep that keep that in mind. I think that may be all. Connie's coming to sing for us. The Lord bless her as she ministers to us in song. <laughs>
for that reminder. One of the one of the things that has been so very, very meaningful to us in the last few days has been how many people have said, we're praying for you, we're praying for your son. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. I, I might just mention this, this detail. Uh, some of you may not know, most of you probably do. The doctor said there was something consistent with pancreatic cancer for my son, Barely, pastors in Oklahoma City. And... Uh, and after the biopsies, uh, the doctor called the day we left Thursday and uh, coming home and, and said, uh, I just, there's, there's a lot that looks like cancer, but I just can't call it that yet. So we've sent your entire uh, file to Mayo Clinic. Well, that was good news to me. I, I was glad to hear that. And, uh, and any time the doctor says, I'm not sure it's cancer, I take that as good news personally. So, uh, so I was grateful for that news and continue to pray. We're supposed to hear, Lord willing, this week uh, from Mayo Clinic. And uh, very possibly he will face some kind of surgery uh, to take out the mass that's there that they have found. Uh, at least that's the, what the doctor projected. Probably they'll want more tissue to, to check further. So... Uh, that's kind of where we are with that. And then I also appreciate prayers for my wife's brother, Verlin. Uh, Verlin lives alone in Georgia, and uh, it's about 500 miles from here. And uh, his daughter doesn't even live real close. It's a couple of hours, I think, to his daughter's, maybe three hours from, from where he lives. And uh, so he's in Athens, Georgia, all by himself in ICU. And yesterday they said, don't expect him to get well. Uh, so we're we're just kind of holding steady, and my Regina called and, and begged. And he said, "Anyway, I'll suit up. I'll do whatever I need to do. Can I come and and go in and at least whisper in his ear? He's on a ventilator." And uh, they said, "No, we're not allowing any visitors." So he has nobody visiting. But uh, I'm glad that doesn't limit God, and we've asked God, the Holy Spirit, to slip in beside him. Talk to him and comfort him and make sure everything's ready for the step into eternity. So I appreciate you praying for, for Brother Verlin. Verlin is 11 years older than Regina. And uh, they have said he tests positive for COVID, but they've also said that that's not the biggest thing going on. There are other issues that are, that are complicated. So let me mention a couple of other announcements I should have mentioned a while ago, and that is on the back of the bulletin, uh, there's a new directory update uh, on our mobile app, and instructions are there on the back of the bulletin. So the bulletins, we've not been passing them out like uh, since COVID and so forth, and so they're on the table in the app. In the vestibule there, get you one, and if you haven't gotten the app, uh, you'll want to do that. Search online member directory, and and uh, download it. And, uh, if you have questions, Tom, wave at us back there. Tom Sabo is, uh, is the resident guru of this, all right? So <laughs> he knows all the answers about this. So if you have questions and struggle with it, uh, Tom's uh, contact information, his email is there. And uh, he, can, he can help you walk you through it and help you get it all downloaded so you can have the church directory. And the nice thing about that is, you know, you can search and find the uh, contact information for our, all of our church family uh, on that. So also, Brother uh, Rick Tallman, our treasurer, has put information for getting your charitable contribution receipts online. And that's also on the back. If you need help with that, see Rick? Rick, wave at that is back there. Rick can help you with that. And uh, if you need a printed copy or don't know how to do it, see Rick. And then there's the Valentine's Day meal. Be sure to pick up a bulletin and read about that. And uh, this is a fundraiser. You know, we, we pay to send a bunch of our kids to uh, the Central Pennsylvania Youth Convention. And they cost us hundreds of dollars to do that. And so the kids from time to time have done fundraisers to try to help with those expenses. And that's what this is about. So a Valentine's Day meal, you can do that for someone you love or just a dear friend. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think 
this, this would be a good way. I'm going to buy one of these and send it to Sister Hill. And uh, I'm going to tell her up front, Sister Hill, you're getting a Valentine's meal from me, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so I'll pay for that, and she'll get it, and it'll help pay for the, the uh, you could, and you could do that as well. You might want to do it for Sister Hill, just have it delivered a different time than mine. Just don't do three or four at the same time, but some of our seniors and others, and I'd like to see why. Let's see here, Brother and Sister Sankey get one, and uh, let's see, Brother and Sister Tallman get one. <laughs> So, uh, Dear, we're the same thing about filling our paper because we do need a paper that tells them how many meals we're going yes, to Yes, yes. This is not a random thing. There are instructions here. I'm not going to take time to read all of this. Get one of these and look at the instructions, all right? So if you want to participate, and every husband here ought to buy one for his wife, all right? And uh, all the ladies said, Amen. Good. <laughs> So, uh, we do have to know how many. We do have to know. So uh, it can't be a random thing. No. We're not just cooking a big pot and saying, yeah. come and get it. So uh, we're taking orders is what I'm saying. So, uh, so the instructions are there. Be sure and, and uh, get that and participate in that. And help the kids. You know, they've done some car washes and different things, but this year it didn't work out that way. And so uh, before cold weather. So anyway, take advantage. Well, yes. Yes, the kids can go to Junior Church. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. All right, the kids can go to Junior Church. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 40, if you have your Bibles. Brother Sankey, in expressing his desire this morning, said something to the effect that I want to see God. I want to know he's near. I want to see revival. The last few days have made me want to see God. I want to see him better. I want to see him more clearly. I want to see him more accurately. You know, it's dangerous to see God inaccurately especially in a crisis. <clears throat> we, have, uh, we have been through national crises. We've been through a lot of things, a lot of our families. Our own family has been through a lot in the last few days. And if you don't see God accurately in the crisis, you run the risk of coming to wrong conclusions. You run the risk of having wrong expectations. If you're not seeing God accurately, you run the risk of seeking solace in the wrong places. And really, you, you run the risk of coming to a conclusion of a God who is really not accurate at all. It's, it's not the true God. And that's extremely dangerous. I think it is very, very common. I think it's happening everywhere. It's amazing to me. We, <laughs> we have seen it in politics. It's amazing to me how people use religion as a prop and a profess faith in God as a prop, even for wickedness, <laughs> evil. Uh, We've all been through a lot as a church, as a nation, as individuals, and it has all brought me to this subject. What is God like? Isaiah chapter 40, I'm going to skip through some verses you might want to just follow or listen. Isaiah chapter 40, let's begin with verse 18. The question, to whom will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? Verse 25, again, to whom will you liken me, God says, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. Behold, who hath created these things that 
bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one failing. I say hallelujah, that's God. Verse 27, why sayest thou? And, and, and really you think about this. In, in, the, in the light of God calling the stars by name, that's a, I'd say that's a pretty good feat, wouldn't you? He, he calleth them all by name. But Isaiah says to Jacob, to Israel, why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Isaiah says, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth, youth shall fail and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We began here last week considering the questions of verse 18 and verse 25. To whom will you liken me, God says. What is God like? That is a question that we all desperately need to see and confront in our own lives and hearts. We're living in a world of a distorted God. Really, the setting of the question here in Isaiah is the nation of Israel. And you look at their history for just a moment, and I want to do that. Israel was desperately in need of a fresh revelation of what God was like. Their faith had been challenged. Their circumstances and God had collided as we talked Last time in the message, I think I said last week, but it was a week ago, two weeks ago today. Their circumstances in God had collided. They were drowning in agnostic questions. You remember, God had proven himself over and over again in the history of the children of Israel. During the exodus from Egypt and the leadership of Moses, during the conquering of the land and the leadership of Joshua, when the land became theirs. The period of the judges was an up and down experience. But even then God over and over and over pro proved himself to the children of Israel. Under the leadership of Samuel God prospered Israel. Even when they asked for a king and God said, that's not my first plan, but Samuel I want you to anoint a king. I'm going to give them the desires of their heart and Still, there were, there were amazing victories under Saul, the first king. Amazing advances under David, the second king. Unbelievable prosperity under the third king, Solomon. But if you know the history of the children of Israel, things begin to unra unravel when Solomon died. The kingdom was divided under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Israel under Jeroboam in the north, and Judah under Rehoboam in the south. And it was downhill from there. Religion became corrupted. Idolatry increased. Morals declined. Kings came and went. Most of them were corrupt. Corrupt. The nations of Syria and Assyria were making war. Prophet after prophet cried out, trying to get the people to turn back to Jehovah God. And finally, the northern kingdom, Israel, was conquered by Syria and ceased to exist as a nation. 27,000 prisoners were taken. Israel was probably, or Isaiah rather, was probably middle-aged when Israel was destroyed. Finally, there was the excruciating experience of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. I was just, we were driving down the road and my wife has been following a, uh, a kind of a blog sort of thing called Behold Israel. It's a Jewish man, I can't pronounce his name, but he, uh, he does little, little sermonettes or podcasts or whatever you call them and 
She was listening to one of them as we drove down the road the other day, and he was standing in front of a large pile of rocks behind him in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. He began to talk about these rocks behind me were part uh, of the, the temple. He told how big, and I don't even remember the number. I think some of those rocks were several tons in size. And, and he, he told how Israel had a beautiful temple. And, and the temple to them was a sign of, uh, of changelessness. It was a sign of their God. It was a, a sign of something that was permanent and stable and would be there forever. And, and yet... You know the story. The holy city was destroyed. The Hebrew people were taken to Babylon, resettled in Babylon. The cherished land was ruled totally by pagans. In the New Testament, Jesus prophesied, you remember, not one stone will be left on another. And that man who's standing there in front of a pile of stones turned and pointed to them as evidence and said, God was right. What the people had come to trust in as something that would never change, that would always be here, was suddenly destroyed. And it's a pile of rubble today, a pile of rocks. And in that day in the Old Testament destruction in 586, the anguishing question. The agnostic question surfaced by the score. Where was the God of Israel now? How could God allow this to happen? Why did the innocent seem to suffer with the guilty? Did God know or care about their plight? What about God's promises? What about the covenant God had made with his people? And now in heathen Babylon, their God was in competition with Murdoch. The gods of heathenism. The, all of the gods of he, heathenism. And their question was, is our God, is Jehovah God really greater than these heathen gods? That's the setting of Isaiah, Isaiah's question, really God's question in verse 18 and 25. Israel desperately needed a renewed revelation of the awesome greatness and power and majesty of the God of heaven. Friend, I believe we desperately need that in our generation. You know, the, the picture that I just drew for you from Israel, ancient Israel years ago, that, that in, that there might have been a time when that would seem distant and un, uh, unconnected to us. But all of a sudden, it's not difficult to relate the question of Israel to real life in 2021, is it? We ask, where is God? Where is God when a morally corrupt politician makes decisions that affect us all? Where is God when abortion is legalized and then celebrated? You know, we're in, uh, we're in the right to life celebration time. I believe it was last Sunday, but, but we're in that, that period of time when right to life people are marching and trying to advance that cause and right in the face of it our new president edict, uh, issues an edict by the stroke of a pen that says we will not only condone it but we'll finance it around the world we'll send your tax dollars my tax dollars to pay for the killing of babies around the world liberal just justices established policies for perversion Crime hits home. Pornography runs rampant. Hollywood is corrupt. Freedoms disappear. Where is God in all of this? Friend, I want to tell you, in those kind of crises, it's very, very important that we see clearly and accurately who and what God is really like. But it can come a whole lot closer than just a political scene or a national scene comes right down to real life. Where is God when I'm going through what I'm going through? Where is God when I've lost my job or I'm under pressure or my wife doesn't understand or my husband is unkind and ins insensitive, my kids walk on my heart, I'm flat on my back, COVID has come. 
Where is God when my loved ones are laying in Georgia in intensive care and no one can go? Friends, that's real. That's not yesterday or tomorrow. That's, that's now. That's today. Where is God when it gets real, real close? I talked to some preacher friends of mine just in the last few days. One of them was telling me all of the circumstances of his life and ministry. A man up in years now, really beyond retirement age, several years my senior. But broken hearted, just a broken man, really. And I've stayed, tried to stay close to him because I wanted to see what God is really like. I don't want the devil to rob him. We need a clear vision of what God is like in those moments. We need to see and acknowledge, as I preached last time, his greatness. Isaiah said, what is God like? He's greater than I am. Hallelujah. Any thought of the human mind, any creation of the human hand, he sits on the circle of the earth. He stretches out the heavens as a as a curtain, he's spreading them out as a tent to dwell in. He's greater than I am. Thank God that he is. Yeah. Greater than my problems, greater than my hurts, greater than my crises, greater than my circum circumstances, greater than my confusion. Acknowledge his greatness. But I want to go on and talk about not just acknowledging his greatness, but acknowledging him. You know, you would think, you would think that that's not a problem in religious circles in these days. Acknowledging God as creator. If you would think that, you would think wrong. The Enquirer, Cincinnati Enquirer, did a story a number of years ago, and I read the story and clipped from the story. It was about Pope John Paul II. He was Pope at that time. And it gave his view of creation. <laughs> and the, 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 the article was, was entitled, Pope, Evolution Theory's Okay if God's Role is Acknowledged. <laughs> so I guess what he's saying, it's all right to believe that I evolved over millions of years from green slime as long as I believe God created the green slime. I read an article about a new study reported in the journal Science. <laughs> Science? Really? In that, in that uh, journal, some guys came up with a new origin for the date of higher animals. And of course, they would put man in that category, higher animals. <laughs> they did this by mathematically traveling backward the changes that are known to occur in genes. So these intellectual crazies <laughs> mathematically went backwards. And this is what they found. They found that instead of animals appearing 500 million years ago, <laughs> evolution scientists missed it by a few mi hundred million years. Higher animals, he said. Uh, began 1.2 billion years ago. <laughs> now, I don't know how you travel back mathematically and come to that conclusion, but that's what they are smart guys. And what these guys said was there's no fossil record that could even be twisted to support this. So these guys decided, I don't know whether they did this mathematically or not, but they decided that that early animals were fragile, squishy things that were unlikely to leave a fossilized imprint. <laughs> That's handy. You know, if you decide that higher animals 1.2 billion years ago were squishy things that didn't leave a fossil, you can make it say anything you want to say. So I guess... The Pope may need that kind of nonsense to tell where we came from, but I want to tell you, 
I prefer to turn over to Genesis and begin to read. God said, let there be, and there was. I prefer to go to Genesis 1, 26 and 27 and read, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Friends, I want to tell you, this transgender stuff is an affront to God the Creator. Mark it down. They're trying to cast that as a civil rights issue. It's not a civil rights issue. It's an affront to God the Creator who created male and female and not 20 other genders. And not a gender I just decide I am. What to do. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God created you, and therefore God owns you by creation. He has something to say to you, his creation. He loves you as, your, as his creation. God created you. Let's think about this for just a few moments here. God created the universe. Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high. He hath created these things. He bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names. I'll never forget a few years ago going to Alaska for the first time and on a, on a clear night in Alaska. I don't know if you've ever seen the stars in the sky quite like Alaska shows them. <laughs> I've never seen it down here. I, I just Even on a clear night, I've never seen what I saw in Alaska. It was just like they were dotted up there. Just, um, just everywhere. Just, just everywhere. Uh, gorgeous. One translation says it like this, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Hast thou not known the creator of the ends of the earth? <laughs> really, this was a challenge to the pagan gods. Many of the pagan deities were thought to dwell among the stars. But Isaiah said, your God is the creator of the stars. He made them. He named them. It's not hard to stand in astonishment at the work of the creator, is it? you stopped long enough lately to see the boldly written signature of God in the world you live in? One writer said, what is life if full of care you have no time to stand and stare? <laughs> He's the creator of the ends of the earth. God made the universe so large that man has never found the end of it. But Isaiah said, God created the ends of the earth, wherever that is. They tell me if you drove a car day and night at top speed for 24 hours, seven days a week, it would take you nine years to drive to the moon. If you drove that same car seven days a week, 24 hours a day, it'd take you 300 years to get to the sun. It'd take you 8,300 years to get to Neptune. And it would take you 7 million years to reach the star. What a waste of a lifetime. <laughs> and our solar system with the sun at the center of nine planets in orbit around it, it's 3,700 million miles. 3,700 million miles from the sun to the furthest planet, Pluto. Pretty good hop and skip over there to Pluto. But our solar system is on the smallest part, a small part of the Milky Way galaxy. And in the Milky Way galaxy, there are 250 million stars. And you want to run your own life? Hmm. Isaiah says he calls them by name. 
I'm talking about knowing God accurately right. as creator. No wonder the psalmist said, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy hands, the finger, the, the, the work of thy fingers, the sun and the moon, the work that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Right. Mm -hmm. God's creator of the vastness of the universe. God is creator of the unexplainable. You know, Modern man with his technology and man, I'm I'm awed by technology like the rest of us, like all of us are. Think about them going down my son's throat into his stomach and sticking a needle through to his pancreas and taking a biopsy. I think, man. Think about them going through an artery up into my heart while I'm laying there asleep and my heart's pumping away and Freezing circuits in my heart. Had it done four times. Unexplained. But you know, all God has to do, all God has to do to stump modern man is set a spider down. One of those things that we say, oh, get me. <laughs> a spider. And God made a spider with an ability to make spider web, silk. And that little web is five times stronger than steel and twice as elastic as nylon is waterproof. And we squish it. And God created the unexplainable. With all of man's synthetic inventions, he's never duplicated spider silk. God creates a little, a, an ugly little beetle called a rhinoceros beetle. The rhinoceros beetle regularly carries ten times its body weight without even breaking a stride. That'd be like a 200-pound man walking briskly around with 2,000 pounds on his back, in case you want a comparison. In experiments, that little beetle has been able to carry a hundred times his body weight. That'd be like a man carrying eight tons. God sits an ugly little old beetle down and says, look at that. I created that. God made an animal kingdom to be, to be governed by instincts. Man has never been able to explain animal instincts. I've I raised dogs. I've watched a mother dog for the first time have a litter without any Lamaze classes or breeding treatments and all that stuff. And I've watched that new mother take care of those puppies. Nobody taught her. Nobody gave her instruction or sent her through classes. She just knew instinctively what to do. They tell me the monarch butterfly will a female monarch butterfly will fly, fly 9 to 1,500, 900 to 1,500 miles from southern U.S. and Mexico to northern U.S. and Canada. And lay their eggs on milkweed pods and die. And those eggs hatch and become caterpillars. And they feed on the milkweed plant. But the milk of the milkweed plant is poisonous. So that little caterpillar will cut out a little spot of the milkweed and eat just a little bit first to build up a resistance to the poison. <laughs> and then we'll feed on that milkweed sap, poison sap. Become a, cat, a caterpillar will become a butterfly. And in the fall of the year, they gather in huge flocks and fly 900 to 1,500 miles south where they've never been before, the southern U.S. and Mexico without maps or direction. <laughs> and God says, I did that. The Creator did that. Look at your own life. God made you. Hmm. The psalmist said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully. The average man's body is made up by 
10 to the 30th power or 300 trillion cells. And every cell has exactly 46 chromosomes. And each chromosome has 800 million genes. <laughs> and you want to run your own life. And that body that has 300 trillion cells with exactly 46 chromosomes, 800 million genes, started with one cell. <laughs> a uniting of a, of a cell from a mother and a father, getting exactly 23 chromosomes from the mother and 23 chromosomes from the father. And that single cell with 46 chromosomes and 800 million genes has all of the distinguishing characteristics that I have at 65 and Brother Sankey has at 85. You have at 18 or 22 or 62 or whatever it is. You know, friends, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I believe it's an affront to God, the Creator, to kill an unborn baby is because when God unites two cells, one from the mother and one from the father, 23 chromosomes from each. I have 46 chromosomes and 800 million genes. In that one cell, there's nothing that has to be added to that cell but nourishment and growth to make you and me what we are today. Nothing is added but nourishment and growth. That's why abortion I don't care who says it's not. It's evil. It's an affront to God the Creator. And beginning with two cells that unite to form one cell, that one cell divides and divides and divides billions and billions and billions of times. And cells begin an eventful journey of building a marvelous body, a marvelous man. Some of those cells are leaders and directors. Some seem to obey orders meticulously and faithfully and immediately. Some of those cells are masons. Some of them are plasterers. Some of them are generals. Some of them are workmen. Some of them are doctors. And some of them are lawyers. And some of them are merchants. And some of them are sailors. And some of them are policemen. And some of them are soldiers. And without any direction, Without any previous experience, without any training, they begin to build the marvelous structure of the human body on one cell. Within a few weeks, pumping engineers show up and start building a little one-chambered heart first. Simple. Heart begins to pump, beat. At the same time, in another corner, there are plumbers that are laying down all kinds of pipelines that one chambered heart that the engineers constructed. The pump begins to pump fluid through the pipelines. If you look closely, the system is moving like a cafeteria conveyor belt on which are all kinds of things to eat. So all the carpenters and plumbers and electricians have their food right at their doorstep. Within two months, out of nowhere, there appear bone builders. They begin to lay down their structure like a man would build a skyscraper. There appear teeth carpenters. They need a special cement to prepare enamel, dentine. They lay down the teeth, but the amazing thing about the teeth are they're delayed. They're there. Their materials are all there. But something tells them to just hold steady. We'll need you after a while. You don't come yet right time they burst through. All the workers are furiously working. By three months everyone's on the job. Everything's teeny. Everything's busy. The bone builders are gathering calcium and phosphorus in the right proportions and laying down a building for a skeleton. The plumbers are laying down all those thousands of miles of pipelines. The electricians are laying down all those cables for the best communication system known to man. 
It took man generations to figure out fiber optics. One cell has all the secrets. <laughs> By this time, the, mo the most marvelous of all the tissues, the inductoring glands, are beginning to manufacture their hormones. Those messenger boys are sent to every part of the marvelous body. By now, there are power machines that are making muscle that is being rigged up and ready to hold the whole thing together so it doesn't fall apart. There's the photographic and the auditory department, like on no other. <laughs> the auditory system is being called in. Their constant construction of a, a, the most marvelous camera known to man. The eye will consist of a cornea and a lens and a tiny muscle around it. There will be a retina, a retina and an optic nerve that's connected to the rest of the body. For perfect, perfect protection, there's an eyelid that goes over. It has a special smooth membrane on the inside. On the outer side, there's a little water fountain that keeps the photographic masterpiece constantly washed and bathed and meticulously clean without any fanfare. It just happens so you can blink your eyes and see. After everyone has done their part, there's a little workman, they're a little workman without any teaching, without any training. They've done their work, and one day mommy says, I think this is time. Daddy faints. <laughs> the doctor says, you have a healthy boy, a healthy girl. And God has done it again. He's created, man. He's created. You don't have to go back to Eden. To, you don't have to go back to the beginning. You don't have to do that to know the miracle of creation. Right. You are a marvelous, unexplainable creation of Almighty God. And you want to run your own life? Right. Things are just getting started and my time's getting away. But I've got to go through this quickly. Listen fast. Things begin to grow. What makes them grow? No one knows. <laughs> but as the days pass, it's growing and growing. What tells the growth to stop? The head grows to the right size. According to what those genes say, it stops. The arms grow to the right size and stop. The heart grows to the right size and the feet and the liver. How big? How long? No one knows. The mysteries of a marvelous man created by an intelligent creator. The amazing thing is, in this whole process, everything is constantly wearing out. You know, one of the, one of the best arguments against evolution is... Everything is not evolving up. Everything is evolving down. Everything is not building to a higher form. Everything is deteriorating to die. But here we are living. What are we to do? All those cells are constantly dying. But God thought of that too. Right. So every moment you live, your entire being is being rebuilt. Everything is being torn down and reconstructed. You never have a sign closed for repairs. The new little workmen constantly come and take the place of the workmen who are worn out and die. Solid bone is rebuilt piece by piece. The structure never loses strength. Every unit of the eye is being taken apart and rebuilt and never loses a moment of sight. The pipelines are constantly being replaced, but the steam never has to be turned off. The electrical cables are being rebuilt. You don't have to turn off the current. We need new brains. We never miss a thought. We need new lungs. We never miss a breath. We need new stomachs. We never miss a, miss a meal. We need new hearts. We never miss a beat. We need new eyes. We never miss a sunset. In fact, all of this replacement work is done piece by piece, and we don't even know it's happening. Can you imagine a factory like that? amazing things about these cells. Billions and billions of cells have the knowledge of their creator in them. The chemical knowledge of cells is fascinating. You think about it, 
What's necessary for me to manufacture and remanufacture blood that I have to have? An ordinary healthy man has about one and a half gallons of blood. On the inside of that blood, there are at least 30 trillion red cells called corpuscles. These corpuscles are injured and die and destroyed at a rate, listen, at a rate of 72 million a minute. Blood cells, blood corpuscles die at 72 million a minute. And 72 million blood corpuscles have to be replaced every minute. I think I found out why I'm tired. How's it written? How's a red corpuscle made? On the inside of that corpuscle is something called hemoglobin. It's a protein that has a vast capacity for oxygen. Oxygen, in fact, it comes to the lungs. It absorbs oxygen four times as much as itself. Figure that out. And it carries the oxygen to all of those living cells. After that. If you want to look at the marvelous chemical knowledge you know, a molecule of water is, what is, the, what is the sign for water? What is the symbol of water? H2O. You know what that means, don't you? Carbon dioxide is made, or oxygen is made of two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. Real complicated. Carbon dioxide is made of one atom of carbon, two atoms of oxygen. One molecule, molecule of glucose which is body sugar, is made up of six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen. One molecule of hemoglobin is made up of 758 atoms of carbon, 1,203 atoms of hydrogen, 195 atoms of nitrogen, three atoms of sulfur, one atom of iron, 218 atoms of oxygen, for a total of 2,378 atoms and it has to have exactly that composition or it's something besides hemoglobin. And my body makes 72 million of them a minute. And you want to run your own life. Friend, I think if we could see in a new way God the creator who made me, sustains me, keeps me going, sitting here trying to fiddle with all these little old complicated problems that make up my life trying to say how in the world am I going to figure this out and God's making 72 million atoms of hemoglobin a minute with exactly 2300 and something atoms in each one of them I'm just telling you this morning he knows all about you when I get blindsided son with a bad diagnosis. He's not over there saying, what in the world will I do with this one? And that thing that's going through your mind that's part of your life, he's not wondering, oh my, what will I do? He's creator. Your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your motives, your hurts, your 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 failures, your nerves, your pressures, your complicated problems are not complicated to him. Your impossibilities are not impossible. Your confusion is not confusing to him. Your sin is not insurmountable to him. Your bondage is not unbreakable to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Magnify, praise your creator. Amen. It's 12 o'clock and that means it's time for me. I'm going to ask Regina to come. I want us to stand together. You know the little chorus? I think it might be in the chorus book. I can't even remember. How big is God? How big and wide is his majesty?
sustains us, who is able for every need that we face. As we go from this place, rivet this truth on our hearts and make it live in our life, live in our being, live in our choices, live in our decisions. Oh God, we want you to be in charge. Yes, we want you to rule supreme in our hearts. Make it so, we pray. We'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.